hey everyone, welcome back to a new video. Before I begin on the stories, I just wanted to mention, if you have your own personal scary story that you would like to send me for me to possibly narrate here on the channel, you can do so by sending it to southerncannibal.com. So if you have a personal true scary story that you'd like to share, please consider sending it my way. Now that all that's out of the way, let's begin. So this happened last year, and it's still really on my mind. Here it goes. So one night I had my friend Katie over at my house, and we wanted to go and walk to McDonald's by ourselves. We wanted to spend some time together, and McDonald's wasn't that far away from my house. My mom said we could go, and soon after, we'd started our journey and began walking outside in the dark, heading to the McDonald's. Because I was with Katie, I wasn't really creeped out or anything. Well, we eventually made it to the McDonald's, so we headed inside and ordered. When we got inside, we saw that there was a middle-aged man behind us. Now, it didn't really make us feel uncomfortable. That is, until Katie looked at him for a second, and she pulled me aside, saying that the old man was staring at her asses. I honestly thought she was joking, but she was acting really serious, and she wanted to leave immediately. So for her sake, I decided we would. We left with our food, of course, and to my absolute shock, the man followed us. I was beginning to get really creeped out at this point, and so was Katie. We started speed walking, and the man was as well, telling us hard now. We went from being creeped out and concerned to now completely terrified. It was complete silence until the man then said, For young girls, y'all have really nice asses. I wonder what your panty sizes are. I really wish I could give y'all a wedgie. <laughs> so at that point, survival mode kicked in for the both of us. We started running as fast as we could, not once looking back. We heard footsteps running behind us too. When me and my friend finally saw the house, we both ran like a bat out of hell, all the way until we were finally on the front porch. And thank God that my mom left the door unlocked for us to get inside. Because when we opened the door and looked back, the man was still running after us. And as we looked a little closer, we then saw a knife in his hand. We immediately closed the door. My mom, with a look of confusion on her face, asked what was going on. We told her to look out the window, and she did, and we did too, and to my absolute shock, the man was still outside my house and screaming obscenities at us, still talking about our asses and asking about our panty sizes. He did eventually walk off after that, with the knife still in his hand. My mom was going to call the police, but there's no point once the man left us alone. We told my mom what happened after we went to the McDonald's and how it all led to this crazy ass man following us. We were horrified, but we were really glad that we finally made it home safe and sound. A lot of people might think this story is too mild to even be considered scary, but for me and Katie, this is one of the creepiest experiences to have ever happened to us. I really hope that man didn't pull this on any other young girls, but in reality, he probably did. For some background, I'm a 26-year-old female that spent my childhood living between a semi-big city and a college town. I have two older brothers that are eight and six years older than me, and a sister three years younger. Before my parents met in corporate America, my dad was a police officer. This is relevant later. From the time I was born until I was eight, my family still lived in my parents' starter home from the 90s. When they purchased the home a few years before I was born, the neighborhood was blossoming, literally. There used to be most well-maintained yard competitions, full of newly married couples having their first kids and families. My granddad lived a block away. Some of the neighborhood kids were my brother's ages and other neighbors had kids that I'd grow up through my toddler phase with. Before I get into the story, 
I need to set the stage for how the neighborhood grew with my siblings and me. As we grew up, my brother's friends grew more and more mischievous. There were gangs that controlled the middle school bathrooms, making other kids pay money or take a beating to go in. We had bomb threats from the time I was in first grade, and they happened so often that I remember instead of getting scared, sitting in a field watching my teacher go into a building and just thinking, I really hope she doesn't get blown up today. The neighborhood school slowly added more and more security measures to the point where the fence around the playground looked like a prison yard. The teenagers would break into empty houses and light grease fires, old Christmas trees, etc. When I was seven years old, my granddad was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. He was in in-home hospice care and he had a plethora of medications to manage his pain and comfort. He heard a knock on the door and thinking it was the cable man, told them to come in. To his surprise, a young man my brother's age walked into his bedroom. The teenager sat at his bedside and held pleasant conversations with him until he picked up several bottles of my granddad's painkillers and left. The teenager was later found passed out in the driveway right across from my granddad's house and was in an overdose-induced coma last I heard, which was nearly two decades ago. Now, the neighborhood McDonald's. Next door, there was a small strip mall with a subway and a wing house, and the McDonald's parking lot had two entrances on opposite sides. Being seven, I requested only a plain cheeseburger and my Happy Meal. This McDonald's had a habit of not following this customization, and since I would refuse to eat it, my parents had to go back through the drive-thru to get another one. On this night... It was already dark, so it was after 8 p.m., and my parents had taken my four-year-old sister and me through the McDonald's drive-thru. Again, I was seven, so I don't really remember the exact time or why we were at McDonald's so late. I got my Happy Meal, and to no one's surprise, my cheeseburger had all the condiments. Ketchup, mustard, onions, everything. All of the enemies of a seven-year-old. My dad was driving our SUV, and as we turned around the building to go back into the empty drive through a sedan came racing into the opposite side of the parking lot to a swerving stop, and the passenger door flew open. With my dad's cop background, he instinctively knew that this was about to turn into a very dangerous situation. He took a sharp turn and placed our car between the sedan and the opposite exit of the lot, preventing the car from exiting without having to hit the building. Probably not a great move with two young children in the car, but his cop instincts took over, and I digress. Within seconds, we saw red and blue lights from all sides, and heard sirens wailing, and police cars then squealing in. My dad quickly pulled our SUV into a parking spot. Suddenly, the entire McDonald's brick outside and golden arches were totally highlighted red and blue, and officers had guns pointed at the sedan demanding the driver and passengers to get out. A woman sat in the driver's seat sobbing, and a man jumped out of the passenger seat, gun aimed at the police, using the door as a shield. Another man sat in the back seat, making no movement. Shots were fired on both sides, and the man took off running into the only corner of the lot that contained woods as officers sprinted after him. Multiple officers rushed to remove the woman and the other man from the car, and they had them in cuffs, while my dad stepped out of our car to talk to the remaining officers at the scene. The officers informed my dad that the armed man robbed the subway next door shortly before. The men shot both young female workers, killing one in the store and forcing the other to crawl to the wing house, leaving a trail of blood behind her while she desperately scraped her entire body on the concrete fighting for her life in any way to get help. She was able to get the hostess to call 911 and eventually recovered in the hospital. I no longer wanted my happy meal as my four-year-old sister and I cried quietly in the car while my mom tried to comfort us with a terrified look on her face. We left the situation with the cops and went to go check on my granddad. For the rest of that night, I honestly thought the man was going to find us 
and I jumped at any tap in the night. I moved to my college town when I was eight and attended university there before moving to my post-grad job in New York City. I spent three years there and have since moved back to my original hometown. While I live over half an hour away from my parents' old house and at McDonald's, I still get the chills sometimes if I happen to drive by that strip mall. So back when this story took place, I was 16 years old. I'm a female, and I've had a lot of creepy men say things to me about my body since the early years of secondary school. Here in the UK, we'll leave school at 16 for those of you who don't know. I was studying for my A-levels and was in need of a part-time job in order to save up for driving lessons as soon as I turned 17. I decided to work for a well-known pizza fast food delivery place, a bus ride away from my home. I lived with my mom and siblings at the time, and I was really excited to start helping her out with money. The first few weeks went really smoothly. My boss was really kind, a sweet older man who cared for his workers. I worked on the front, taking calls and orders, making up the pizza boxes, and cleaning mostly. The co-worker that this story is about was a delivery driver, even older than my boss. He was a large overweight guy who we'll call Mario for this story. Not only for privacy, but also because I barely remember his name or know how to spell it. Mario would always make small talk with me whenever he was waiting for an order. He would work in the week mostly, but on Sundays, he would sometimes come in for a few hours to help out. I worked all weekend every weekend, and I had gotten to know him pretty well in the first month of me working there. One day I finished work a little earlier than usual, as the store was really quiet that day. My boss, who will call PJ, let me go home this Sunday, and told me to get home safe as usual. I left my shift, really happy that I was going to be able to get back home earlier than I had done on a Sunday afternoon in such a long time. I was at my bus stop, which was right around the side of my workplace. I was right in the middle of messaging my friends, asking if they wanted to meet up, with me being available on a weekend and all, when I then heard my name being called. I looked up, my eyes scanning the area that the voice had came from. On the other side of the road, Mario was there sat in his car, waving at me and smiling. I waved back and smiled not saying anything else. As I was about to carry on messaging my friends, he called me again, this time adding something else. Hey, did you want a ride home? PJ just asked me to see if you needed one. He questioned cheerfully. I thought about it for a moment, recalling all the times my mom had ever taught me about stranger danger and to never get into strangers' cars. However, I knew this guy, he seemed harmless, and I also trusted PJ's judgment of this man, so I decided to take his offer. With it being a Sunday, the buses were so staggered, and the next one wasn't due for another half an hour or so. I then stood up and headed over to his car. I asked him if he was sure, and he nodded. I got in the passenger side and did my seatbelt, while he explained that PJ had also just let him off early and mentioned that I had left not long ago. We set off and I thanked him, thinking about how thoughtful and nice he was, but I was completely wrong. He pulled into the next street and I told him where I lived. He slowly tapped in the postal code into his navigation app on his phone. Then he just kind of sat there. So how much does PJ give you an hour? Mario asked me, which caught me off guard. I guess it's a normal thing to ask, but Mario and I weren't super close, and it just seemed really off to me. I just responded with my answer, and I asked him if he could start back up his engine, as I really needed to get home to help my mom with something. Of course it was a lie, but I couldn't think of anything else off the top of my head. He just smiled and nodded, turning his key, and slowly pulling off the curb. He was following the way that his phone was saying, so I wasn't super on edge. He told me how much he makes and what that equals to a year, telling me how he has lots and lots of money and stuff. I just kept saying how nice that was for him, 
not really giving him much to go off of, as to be honest, I really didn't care. He then asked me my age, and this is where it gets really weird. I told him I was 16, and immediately his face lit up. He smiled widely, nodding enthusiastically. 16? But you don't look that young. You have the body of someone older, he said, looking down to my thighs and my chest. I felt sick as soon as he said it. I looked out the window, trying not to panic. We were on a dual carriageway, going really fast at this point. You look around 18. I just nodded, now looking forward and awkwardly laughing. It's all I could think to do. My daughter is 16, but her chest is so small and hard, and her legs are so thin and bony. He carried on. This made me completely freeze. A, why is he comparing me to his daughter? Having a child my age should instantly put him off and shouldn't turn him on. And B, how the heck did he know his daughter's breasts felt hard? Had he felt them himself? I was so terrified by this and decided to just keep quiet. Maybe he would take the hint, but he didn't. When I turned to look at him and see if he was staring at me, he was. He would only look away every now and then to watch the road. After what felt like an eternity of him doing this over and over again, he said something else that made my stomach churn. My boobs are fat and droopy, aren't they? He asked, winking at me. I almost threw up. He took his hand closest to me and picked up his boob and started moving it around. It probably sounds funny now, but at the time, I was so, so confused and disgusted. He asked me to feel it, and that's when I started to think this guy was absolutely crazy. I declined, and I told him I didn't think it was a good idea, but he insisted. And after the third time, he stopped asking and instead demanded, telling me to do it. He reached for my hand and pulled on me to touch his chest. I panicked, saying no thank you a few times but it was no use, so I quickly poked him, causing him to laugh maniacally. I then retreated back to the door of the car, trying to get as much distance between us as possible, and when I looked out the window, I realized I had no idea where I was. I looked towards his map to see that we were still around 20 minutes away from my house. I live in a small city, so in the car, my home is definitely no more than 15 minutes away from my old work. I asked him why we were so far, and he told me it was because he knew a shortcut. Of course I didn't believe this, and I reached into my pocket and slowly took out my phone. I sent my location to my mom and friends discreetly, before then asking him if he could just follow the map. He tried to reassure me that his way was quicker, so I told him I would get out at the next street, as I just got a missed call from my mom and that she would come get me if she has my location. I made this all sound as casual as possible. This seemed to work quite well, as he said that in the next turn, he would need to go back to the map way. I told him that was fine, and to please keep on it, and he said that he would. The rest of the way, I had my hand in my pocket, holding onto a pen that I kept from work when writing down orders. I promised myself I would use it if necessary, and that if anything else happened, I would get out of the car if he stopped at a traffic light. But we didn't stop. Not until we were near my house. He spoke more along the way. And whenever he would make himself laugh, he would tap on my thigh with his hand, letting it linger for a second or two before retracting it. Each time getting higher and higher. After the third time, I decided to cross my leg over to the other, turning diagonally so he wouldn't be able to reach. When we finally got to my street, I pointed out to a house that wasn't mine. When we parked up, he asked for my number, and he said he would pick me up and drop me off from now on to save me from getting on the bus. I told him that I would be okay, but he still insisted. So I opened my door, and I just let him put his number in mine. He did so, and he saved it, handing me it back. When he began to turn his car around, I dug behind a wall to one of the houses, and when I could no longer hear his car, 
I made a run for my actual house. Bursting through the door, I began to sob, explaining everything to my mom, who was furious. She then called PJ, and she told him the story for me, to which PJ apologized profusely. He asked for us to both come in and give him a statement to give to HR, and I did. During the next evening, when my mom took me up there, PJ then told me that Mario had been let go, and he actually cried to them, saying he had children himself, and that he would never want this to happen to his daughters. PJ also told me that he believed me straight away, as he never told Mario I had gone home early, or that he should give me a ride. But the thing that gave me the chills was that PJ discussed with my mom that Mario lived in the next city over, which was around a 30 minute drive in the opposite direction to where I lived. So why on earth did he offer to drop me off? What a creep. PJ was actually better than the police, as they did absolutely nothing other than tell me not to get into people's cars and that they would see what they could do. I guess they're right, and I definitely learned my lesson. I'd really like to think that I'd be much firmer when saying no to creeps like that. I just really hope his daughter is okay. But yeah, that's my story on a really crazy coworker who I really hope to never see again.